It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you to give a brief overview of some of my thinking on these issues, uh, drawing to on quite a lot of research, but also reactions to uh, how the world has developed over the last six months since the COVID pandemic. And uh, my talk is uh, entitled Automation and Labor in the Post-COVID World. Uh, but I'm actually going to spend quite a bit of it about pre-COVID trends, highlighting that we had major problems in the US labor market, which are actually indicative of more generally OECD labor markets, but let me focus on US for uh, making this more concrete and briefer. So here is exhibit one in showing that something is fundamentally wrong in the US labor market. What I'm showing is the evolution of private sector labor demand or private sector wage bill, which is how much the private sector is paying in total to labor. On the left, that's the evolution of that wage bill relative to population divided by population in the four decades following World War II. This is a remarkable picture. It shows a very steady and very rapid increase in how much the private sector was willing to spend on labor. It increases about two and a half percent faster than population pretty much every year for four decades. But on the right, you see a sea change. The private sector labor demand first slows down and then flattens out almost completely from the late 1990s to today, so much so that the US private sector is spending only a tiny bit more today than it did 20 years ago on labor. This has had many implications. The fall in the share of labor in national income by a large amount is one of those, but perhaps even more consequential has been the associated changes, which are causally linked to the slowdown in labor demand uh, in the wage structure in the US. Again, just to show you a glimpse, uh, many of you know the broad patterns, but they are remarkable to see nonetheless. I'm showing the evolution of real wages uh, for men and women uh, and by five education groups. And you see that uh, up to about the late 1970s, mid 1980s, this is a picture of a rising tide lifting all boats because labor demand spending by the private sector is going broadly to all groups. And you see the real wages of all 10 demographic groups that I'm showing here growing at more or less that magical two or two plus real rate growth, which means people are getting pretty uh, uh, well off over time. But then uh, you see a much larger inequality from the 1980s onwards. The different curves are fanning out, but even more consequentially, perhaps, especially for men, low education groups, for example, those shown in red and orange, high school dropouts, high school graduates, are experiencing real wage declines. So the real wages of, for example, high school dropouts are about 30% lower today than they were at the, uh, in the, at the end of the 1970s. There are huge social costs of inequality and perhaps even more uh, notable disruptive effects of falling real income for low education men. Uh, I don't need to tell you about the alienation and the political backlash that this creates. Of course, such a complex phenomenon has many, many causes, but my research has focused on its technological roots. Uh, in particular, what this picture does is that it says, well, can we think of different types of technological changes that have been ongoing and their impact on labor demand. So the dashed line is the displacement part of the technological change. It's associated with labor share declines across industries and aggregated up from industry detailed industry level data to the US. And then the black line is what we, what Pascual Restrepo and I call re reinstatement. This comes from technological changes or organizational changes that either create new tasks for labor or find other ways of using labor centrally in the production process so that labor demand, including, including of labor share, increase. In the four decades that follow World War II, there's a remarkable pattern because when you look at the sum of these two effects, the displacement due to automation, reinstatement due to other technological changes, the, the sum, of, sum is approximately zero as shown by the thick blue line in the middle. And again, on the right, of course, the pattern is very different as you might have expected. 
But the, the way in which it is different is noteworthy. Now the dashed line is going negative faster and the black line is increasing much more slowly so that the sum of the two, the thick blue line is heading south and explains uh, the bulk of the slowdown in private sector labor demand. So what this highlights therefore is that a major part of the reason why the private sector is not demanding much labor in the US anymore is because we have put all of our emphasis on automation technologies and not done enough with other technologies. There's nothing wrong with automation technologies and this picture also highlights that they are potentially bringing productivity growth, but they need to be counterbalanced. So the right is an example of lack of counterbalance because they increase productivity to some degree. Well, to what degree we're gonna talk about that. But because other changes helping labor aren't there, at the end, the implications for workers have been quite negative. Now, this is at a high level. If we go a little bit more detail just to get context, let's look at one specific example of automation technologies, industrial robots. And here from the aggregate of the US economy, I'm turning to uh, what happens across local labor markets. So these are 720 commuting zones. And on the horizontal axis, I have how much industrial robot exposure entry there has been in a commuting zone. And on the left, I'm looking at changes in private employment. The same is true for wages. The wages and employment will behave very similarly in this regard, but I'm just focusing on employment. And what you see is that in places that have introduced more robots, there is much less employment relative to the rest of the United States. Uh, some of the places such as Detroit, Lansing, Wilmington, industrial heartland of the United States are indicative of this, but they're not the ones driving the relationship. If you take out those industrial heartland places, the relationship is still very similar to the one that I'm showing here. Once again, this isn't to blame the robots. Robots have actually been a, a fairly major productivity growth driver in the US economy, but it highlights that in places where you had the robots, you did not do anything else to employ and create opportunities for the workers that were displaced from the production jobs that now robots are taking over. Now, AI, that's our purpose and objective is to understand AI, not so much robots. Uh, is AI different? Potentially, yes, because Robots, actually, when you think about them, they've been designed uh, going back all the way to the late 1970s as a way of replacing some very well specified production, manual production tasks. AI is quite different from robots. It's a broad technological platform. You can have many applications and some of them increasing human productivity, generating new tasks for workers. But in practice, so far, uh, and I'm not going to get into the details, but some of my research uh, focuses on this, AI adoption has so far been driven by the same automation imperative by a, uh, by, by a small number of tech companies. It's targeted substituting algorithms for humans, and it hasn't really been extensively used for generating new tasks or generating labor demand. Now, you might say, just like in the example of robots, <clears throat> what's wrong if we don't do these other technological balancing act? We just do automation, but that automation increases our productivity, increases our living standards. Well, there are two problems with that argument. First of all, if you keep on doing automation, even if it increases productivity, it's not going to create a uh, sufficient labor demand. In particular, what you will see is that labor share will keep on declining as it has done by almost 20 percentage points in the U US manufacturing. So if you want, for example, a more equitable distribution of income between capital and labor, just relying on automation isn't an option. But there is another problem, which is what Pascual Restrepo and I call so-so technologies, is that if you put too much emphasis on automation, you are going down uh, towards automation technologies that are not so productive. The all obvious ones everybody is going to uh, uh, introduce. You know, there is no advanced economy that produces cars without robots anymore. But the question is whether you adopt these marginal automation technologies and what makes them marginal is that they're not super productive. But when they're not super productive, then you get a double whammy. 
you have the displacement that they create. They take the jobs away from workers. They substitute algorithms or machines instead of humans, but they don't bring the productivity benefits. Think of automated, automatic uh, checking, self-checking kiosks or automated customer service or excessive automation in Tesla factories. In all of these examples, there is no evidence of productivity gain, but you are actually pushing a lot of workers out of jobs. So now then the question is, if I'm arguing that there is excessive automation, we're doing too much automation and not other things. So why would that be? Well, there are many reasons for it. And I want to focus on two of them. But one of them, I'm going to leave it more to the Q&A, which is the business model of large companies. Today, it would not be an exaggeration to say that US's technological trajectory right now is determined by and large by big tech. If you look at the field of AI, for example, McKinsey estimates that about 80% of money spent on AI comes from US big tech and Chinese big tech. So it is the vision of these companies that determines where our AI technology is going. And when you look at the vision of these companies, specifically because of the particular milieu in which they came, particularly their business model that evolved more than 20 years ago, they are, they are imagining a lean workforce algorithms replacing humans and non-human centric way of doing production. So it is natural that these companies are not going to be the ones spearheading you know, users of new technological platforms for introducing humans more into more centrally into the production process. So I think there is a vision issue. There is an issue of corporate strategy that's important that leads to our too much automation path. But there's also government policy. The fact that US government is not subsidizing blue sky research, but on the contrary, through our tax policy, we may be encouraging excessive automation. This is again, drawing from some of my other recent work. What I'm showing you here is the taxation of capital and labor. If you look at the blue curve there, that's the marginal tax rate faced by labor. And it's been pretty steady around 25%. Capital has always been taxed more lightly in the United States, uh, around 15%. But over the last 20 years, especially software and equipment, which are the two types of capital, of course, more involved in automation, have had their tax rates go from above 15% or just around 15% to less than 5%. This is because of many companies going to S corporation status, tax cuts, and also the very, very generous depreciation allowances. So we are essentially subsidizing firms to adopt machines instead of humans, which of course leads to A, excessive automation, and B, to this sort of social technologies that doesn't bring much productivity gains because the technologies that you're adopting are the ones that you wouldn't have adopted without the tax subsidy, but just because the government hands you money to eliminate workers and get machines, you are doing so. Now, the post-COVID world looks like it's going to go more in that direction. Uh, the majority of the companies say that they are now going to introduce more automation, of course, who wants to deal with social distancing and vulnerability to the virus, and many of them say they're about to do so or they're considering to do so. Now, I have painted a picture in which labor has been badly affected by major changes, including tax policy and including lack of labor demand, low wages, wage decline. So one reaction that many would have is to say, why don't we strengthen labor market institutions and protection for labor? And I'm all for that, especially since many of those protections have been eroded in the US over the last four decades. The real value of the minimum wage is down to about 30% of where it was. Collective bargaining power of workers has fizzled. But it is also important to understand, and this is one of the very important points that is sometimes missed, is that just changing labor market institutions, increasing the minimum wage is not going to be a solution. Why not? Because if our technological trajectory is one in which we put all of our emphasis on automation, what happens if you suddenly jack up the minimum wage to $15 an hour? You give one more excuse for companies to go more into machines and leave the workers aside because workers are not central to the production process. The only way labor market institutions can be effective is if as in the first half or the first two thirds of the 20th century, production process really necessitates workers. So that's again, the technological thing. The reason why I emphasize, for example, government policy towards R&D or tax policy is precisely because those are changes that would make labor more central by changing our technological trajectory. In fact, the future does not need to be automated. 
There is nothing that says that these wonderful technological ideas are, have to be used for automation. If you look at around you, of the people you know, 90% of them are actually performing tasks that did not exist 70, 80 years ago. Or some like us, professors, we are, we, there were professors 80 years ago, but they were doing completely different things. All of this is because we have used technology not just to automate and eliminate labor, but create new vocations, new activities, new tasks for labor. So there are many things that you can do in which AI works with humans, robots work with humans. We use technology to find new ways of humans to use their creativity, flexibility, and ideas. It is a choice, and we have made a choice to automate and get rid of humans, and we can make different choices. That requires many changes, institutional changes. So in some sense, the task ahead of us is to recognize that COVID-19 creates a critical juncture, what James Robinson and I call the critical juncture in our, uh, in our uh, Why Nations Fail. And during critical junctures, you can create a new institutional trajectory for a society. That's exactly what happened, for example, after the Great Depression and after World War II, where the social democratic compact resulted from some people recognizing that there were important regulatory steps, uh, social welfare uh, policy, social safety net, as well as macroeconomic framework that was necessary. So we have a similar situation today. Some of those risks are deeper, but there is one more item on the agenda that's much more central, which wasn't so important 80 years ago, which is regulation of technology. So what I'm calling for is that the new welfare state has to be centered on regulation of technology as much as social safety net and, and the other important issues that the post-war growth was founded on. Now, there are many political economy aspects of this that are important, and that's what some of this, uh, some of what my book with Jim Robinson, the more recent book, The Narrow Corridor, talks about. And I'm not going to have time to talk about this. And again, we can sort of come back to this at some other date. But the, what we can learn is why there were people, very smart people like Hayek, who wrote his Road to Serfdom as a critique of the welfare state 1.0 and why Hayek turned out to be wrong. And the part of the reason why Hayek turned out to be wrong is because he did not understand how society would get engaged in the de protection of democracy and change its social norms, change its political participation to undergird the new regulatory state. So essentially, if we want to prove Hayek wrong again, that we can build a better welfare state, that requires exactly the same sort of steps. And understanding a societal understanding, which is very deep, goes to every sector of society, that business as usual is problematic. We need to go to somewhere else. And then that needs to produce new ways of engaging in politics, new social norms of business, new social norms of citizens, and, 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 and all the institutions that go with it. So in that context, I want to end with the two questions for this group. So if this really requires a broad-based uh, societal change, one important pillar of that are, is going to be AI researchers. So my assessment as an outsider is that AI researchers are right now part of the problem. They do not see that they have a social responsibility. They do not see that they can do as much harm as good when they work on face recognition technologies. They work with security companies that monitor for governments or corporations, that they work without any concerns about eliminating humans, even when that's not actually economically or socially desirable. So we need AI researchers to wake up. And how can we change the incentives and the vision of tech companies? because AI researchers are getting these incentives partly because of the tech companies. So does that require internal dynamics, entry, regulation, breakup? I don't think we can delay discussing these issues and I cannot see a better group of people than this one to actually take on these challenges without prejudice and without, uh, uh, without inhibition. Thank you.